let's meet the starting lineup. The head coach of the Sonics is Nate McMillan. And now the Sonics starting lineup. At center, at seven feet from Georgetown, number 33, Patrick Ewing. Keaton Hall for Michigan and his fab freshman recruits, Andre Barrett and Marcus Toniel, made bolt the school because of it. Hamaker was 68 and 55 in four seasons at Seton Hall. Last year, the Pirates made the Sweet 16, and he had arguably the best recruiting class in the nation, but the Pirates stumbled to 16 and 15 this season, and Amaker has decided to leave. Here, reaction. Most players do. Um, feel a little betrayal, being that. Uh, it seems as though he walked out, but I guess he had, um, like I said, it was in his best interest, I guess, for him to do such. Stay tuned. Meanwhile, at Hofstra, seven years Paul says it's begun in L.A. today, and that is not an April Fool's joke. Knicks really did win it, 79-78. Lakers tried to get Kobe Bryant back in the lineup. But Kobe's sore ankle acted up in the first quarter. He had to leave the game, didn't return. And without Kobe, L.A.'s strategy was simple. Pound the ball down low to Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq powered his way to 31 points against the Knicks. Used Kurt Thomas on that play. Knicks had four guys against Shaq. They started Larry Johnson. Johnson for three. And that has to feel very good for Larry Johnson. Sure had. Had been five for 23. Glenn Rice played in L.A. for the first time since he left. Heard a chorus of boos. Marcus Camby played well offensively and took one for the team. Camby, an all-around force for Van Gundy, 15 rebounds and 20 points, including a jump shot or two. Knicks led by one at the break, then Shaq, key to Laker comeback. A lot of celebs showed up for this one. The former president was seen talking to Warren Beatty. Spike Lee must have known the Knicks were going to play well. He flew out for the game. Say this, both teams hustled. Kurt Thomas took his eye off the pass, and look at Shaq, Kurt Thomas, both going for the loose ball. This is where we got to have no doubt. You go hard, you go for the win right now. It's right there for us. Come on. Knicks responded to the coach's pep talk with time winding down on the shot clock. Marcus can be found net. And Camby has to take the outside shot out of Hicks. That was part of a 10-0 Nick run. Charlie Ward got a lot of playing time on Mark Jackson's 36th birthday. Charlie came through there, but this one was Freewell and Camby down the stretch. And Camby off the front. Yes, and the foul. Latrell Freewell followed Camby with a jump shot that put the Knicks in front. 79-74, and then they had to hold on. Brian Shaw's driving layup got the Lakers within one. Knicks had a chance to ice it, but Glenn Rice was way off, and so the Lakers had one last chance to win it. Would it be Shaq? Uh-uh. Remaining, so they must put it in play here. 5.6 seconds remaining in the fourth quarter. The Knicks with a one-point lead. Here's Fisher taking the shot. Eric Fisher missed the last shot. The Knicks celebrated. And their abysmal road trip ends on a high note, and they come home a happy team after their 79-78 win over the Lakers. Coming up next, Yankee baseball. Yanks. I guess you call this what? Robin's revenge? Yeah, I guess you know, and the Mets made a major statement to anyone doubting their chances of winning that NL East. Naysayers, beware. 
The Mets start their campaign to repeat as NL champs today, and you couldn't pick a better opponent to stake their claim against than on the road playing the Atlanta Braves. And festivities somewhat tainted as a rain delay pushed the afternoon start time back three hours to the evening. But come game time, Mike Piazza wasted no time at all. First inning, he takes Tom Glavin to the opposite field. It goes out for a two-run homer. Mets first on the board. And Al Leiter cruising along with a 2-1 lead into the seventh inning. Then Javi Lopez, though, would hammer the Two equalizer. The bullet to left field, that ties the game. And the Tomahawks would go a-chopping. Then comes trouble. John Rocker to the rescue, facing Robin Ventura, who has never gotten a hit off of Rocker until now. Takes that pitch deep to dead center. A two-run shot. Redemption as the Mets back up 4-2. to two. Braves rally to tie it at four, but go no further. Bottom of the ninth inning. Tusa Yoshi Sinjo, the diving catch to close the door. Covering some major ground. On to extra innings. Ventura back at the plate. He connects. This is no replay. Over the right field fence this time. His second home run. This one the game winner as the Mets win 6-4 thanks to Ventura's four RBIs. To be up and then come back and then to come back and, and take the lead against him is nice. I mean, just, to beat a good team feels good, but uh, you know, obviously one in your division that you're always uh, going head to head with is, is nice. Scored enough runs to win, um, and Al was strong. He, we had a little hiccup in the bullpen, but uh, got enough outs to win the game. The Knicks back at home after a long and dreary West Coast trip tonight, hosting the Orlando Magic at the Garden. And Spike Lee looking about as disinterested as the Knicks were for three quarters of this game. Knicks down 69-60, and it's wake-up time. Latrell Sprewell scores. Knicks with a 12-0 run to lead 72-69. Marcus Camby, the big night, 23 points, 20 boards. Then Charlie Ward off the steal, and this one's for you, Camby. The Knicks make the Magic disappear in a 94-82 win. And thanks to Phil Sims, there are now 90 eight bottles of beer left on the wall, maybe less, as the Nets play the Hornets. Keith Van Horst game stars in action tonight. Top four, two on Yanks. Tino Martinez at third for Paul O'Neill. High fly ball. Benny Agbayani, and he got his man. Comes up throwing. Martinez is safe. 3-1 Yankees. Bottom eight. Mets trail 7-5. And it's Shinjo against Carlos Almanzar. One out. Could have been a double play, but Shinjo beats the relay. That keeps the inning alive for Mike Piazza. Ray Ordonez would score, and Mike Piazza on the express train to a victory. Ninth homer in the last 20 games. Mets take an 8-7 lead on Piazza's 19th. Top nine, Armando Benitez on the hill against Bernie Williams. Bernie Williams, who homered in the first inning, Sitting on a 97 mile an hour fastball. Oh, just foul. Williams hitting a major league best 475 in the month of June. Benitez relieved. Next pitch. Benitez, I don't think we're throwing the fastball. Gets away from Piazza. Gets his man. Game over. Mets come from behind. Second time in five days, the Mets have rallied to win a game after trailing by five or more runs. And call it the city that never sweeps. Seven interleague series between the Yankees and Mets, still no sweeps. Check out Ted Lilly's line, five and a third, one hit, two runs, eight walks, three wild pitches. Rubber match in Atlanta is online at just one it was a memorable run for the cinderella story of the year 2000 coming out of nowhere to capture the nfc championship before the giants fell in super bowl 35 but that was last year today big blue open training camp up in albany and that's where our marvell scott is standing by right now live marvell well scott there's a new mindset here at giants training camp last year they were the underdogs this year they are the top dogs who are trying to avoid getting knocked off their thrones Ready, ready. The troops hit the gridiron to take their first steps towards fulfilling this season's high expectations. People's expectations of us will 99% of the time always exceed maybe your true potential. So it doesn't really matter what people say. It, what matters is what you do on the football field. Over the past few months, the team worked to resolve a number of off-the-field issues. Ron Dane is finally in shape after slimming down to a lean, mean 245 pounds, and Jesse Armstead is back in camp after holding out the entire off-season due to contract disputes. All the more reason to be optimistic. When I stepped on the field, it's all over with. You know, um, 
I have no problem out of it. The only thing left now for others to uh, finally deal with it within themselves. Many feel the Giants will need an out-of-this-world effort to get back to the Super Bowl. And though the 34-7 loss to the Ravens does leave some scars, the focus at this training camp is to surge ahead and not dwell in the past. That, that game is behind us, and we made mistakes, and uh, we learned from it. we got to keep going forward, and that's the only way we're going to be able to achieve again this year. And definitely, with 11 starters returning on offense and 8 on defense, the outlook is definitely looking good for now. But, of course, it is a bit early to predict just how far that experience will take them. Live in Albany, covering the Giants, Marvell Scott, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Scott? All right, thank you, Marvell. Hey, folks, you can forget Lance Armstrong. The Meadowlands is just 8 miles from where the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center once stood. With Manhattan as the backdrop, both literally and figuratively, here's Sal Palantonio. Here at Giants Stadium, we're about 10 miles from the epicenter of the disaster in Lower Manhattan. And in the sound of silence here, there is no sense of irony, no poetry comes to mind. Just a quiet echo of the National Football League, that pillar of American professional sports, put on hold. Outside in the parking lot, there's a different kind of tailgate gathering. The Giants practice bubble has become a staging area for disaster relief. Everything from construction materials to dog food for the canine units looking for bodies in the World Trade Center wreckage. And Giants players have spent the past few days doing what they can. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. This is our backyard. Uh, you know, we drive, we drive to work every day on the turnpike, and uh, guys come up from the south, and they always see the, the uh, World Trade Center. So when you look over, and it's not there. It's definitely, it definitely hits home. And, our sense of duty just to be down here and help out with, with whatever we can. You toss the gloves? All right. Let's not forget the Jets, who also play here. The Jets' biggest cheerleader every Sunday is a guy named Fireman Ed. And it has been suggested that for the foreseeable future, at least, the J-E-T-S rallying cry be changed to F-D-N-Y. The Giants don't play here again until September 30th. That's two weeks away against the Saints. The Jets play the very next night, Monday night, against the 49ers. So plans are already being made. Everything from 160,000 American flags being ordered to a new plan for heightened security. At Giant Stadium, I'm Sal Palantonio. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sal, very much. We'll head back with heavy hearts. In Pittsburgh, the Mets and the Pirates were the first game of the evening. So first, they were perhaps to signal to the rest of the world that the United States will indeed march forward. Although, we began tonight by pausing to remember and honor those who were lost in Tuesday's attack. Signs of patriotism seem to be adorning every man, woman, and child these days. Americans feeling such a sense of togetherness as a result of the attack on our country. And the Mets themselves wearing the caps of the fire department and the police department tonight, the true heroes of our city. Some teary eyes this evening as the national anthem was sung. It is certainly now clear to everyone here in New York that the prayers of the nation are with us. So many of our neighbors struggle with the loss of loved ones. Bobby Valentine, for one, was in the parking lots at Shea over the weekend, helping to load the trucks with relief supplies headed to Manhattan. And after a week's vacation that no one ever would have wished for, baseball was back. A good one between the Mets and the Pirates. Top of the second, two outs, no score. Jay Payton sending one to the gap off Todd Ritchie. The relay, Giles finding Jack Wilson. He fires to third in time to get Payton. And early on, a Met rally was thwarted in the Mets' third. Shinjo batting with the bases loaded. This was not pretty, but the Mets will take it. He takes ball four. Ray Ordonez trots home, and the Mets had a 1-0 lead. Next batter, though, Robin Ventura. Ventura always solid throughout his career with the bases loaded, but he goes down on strikes here. Richie getting him with the good off-speed pitch. The inning was over. Bottom of the fourth, still 1-0 Mets. Pirates threatening. Brian Giles grounds one to short. Ray Ardonez sends one home. Hermanson caught in a rundown between third and home. Al Leiter backing up, eventually puts the tag on. Ordonez doing it with the glove there. And then in the ninth inning, game tied at one. Ordonez does it with the bat. A hot smash past Aramis Ramirez at third. 
Shinjo comes home, beating the throw of Brian Giles. The Mets take a 2-1 lead. Later in the ninth, they add to it Mark Johnson. Pinch hitting for John Franco. Sends one deep off the right center field wall. Peyton scores. Ordonez scores. Off the double from Johnson. Two RBIs. And John Franco and the Mets end up with a win as Armando Benitez gets the final out and the Mets win it 4-1. to one. So an emotional night for John Franco, certainly as a New York native, maybe feeling this tragedy as it hit closer to home for him than it does for most. He was teary-eyed as the national anthem was sung tonight, and the Mets win it 4-1. to one. In the game... Desi Relaford with a couple of hits, as did Ray Ardonez. The big night for Ardonez, though, two for four with an RBI, the go-ahead RBI. He scored a couple of runs as well. Johnson, of course, the two RBI double in the ninth. All of this helping out Al Leiter, who went seven innings, allowed four hits, one earned run. Of course, Leiter not getting the win. John Franco picks up the win in relief. And on came Armando Benitez to record the save. A very emotional evening for John Franco and the rest of the Mets. You know that uh, we caught a peek of it. You have USA and NYC on your cap. Uh, obviously, those initials came easily to you. Uh, I guess they were also on your mind as, as you were out there. Always. I'm, I'm sure it's been on my, everybody here tonight, uh, both teams. And uh, we got a great reception from the fans. The fans are real supportive of yelling USA. And uh, it's just a great, you know, great to see how the country has come together. And uh, it's you know, good to see that baseball is back for a couple hours to give everybody uh, take their minds off of, of what happened. And I know you like to be the tough guy from Brooklyn, but we also know there's a soft side of uh, John Franco. And we saw uh, some tears during the pregame ceremonies as the national anthem was being sung, and God bless America. Yeah, you know, you just uh, think of all the sad things, you know, and uh, it's hard to hold back the emotions. It's great to see John Franco get the win tonight, of course, the New York native. <laughs> Very possibly. I'm just so happy I gave people something to cheer about, said the All-Star catcher. His contribution to the city's spirit and psyche with Friday's home run may have been easier to measure than the distance the ball traveled. Here's Charlie Steiner. It was very touching to see the, the, the firefighters and policemen salute their, their fallen brothers and sisters. Uh, from that onset, I felt like we were just spectators, and, and it was just an honor and a privilege to be here. I took uh, a tragedy like this to hear my first 21-gun salute tonight, and uh, you know, I just remember running out to left field and picking up the shells and stuff from the 21-gun salute and putting them in my back pocket, you know, just to keep them as a reminder. It was a night that spanned the emotional spectrum that brought the Mets and Braves, who've had no love for one another over the years, together. And the city's most famous Yankee fan was most welcome at Shea Stadium. It shows that all America is together. Even in, even in the baseball, when two arch rivals are going at each other, that we could come together and, uh, and for the same cause. And, and plus, uh, our mayor, who usually gets booed here at the stadium, got standing ovation, probably the loudest ovation out of anybody. The improbable Mets have now won 21 of their last 26 and have moved to within four and a half games of Atlanta. But it was the sheer drama of the night that reminds us of how and why sports is so important to us especially at a time like this. I think it was the most important game that any of us have ever been a part of. You know, we played in the Subway Series last year, and I thought that there was no way um, that the emotions of any game could match um, what I felt in game one of that series last year, and this exceeded it uh, tenfold. The Mets contributed a game salary totaling nearly a half million dollars to charity, $68,000 for Mike Piazza alone. But Piazza's eighth inning blast was priceless. I was just so happy that I was able to you know, come through that situation and give these people something to cheer about, which that's what they came out here for, just at least be diverted a little bit from, from you know, the, the, the losses and, and, and the, you know, the sorrow. Mike has come through time and time again, and, and it's only fitting tonight that he came through again uh, when uh, not only all of New York was watching, but I think all of the country was watching us. Uh, uh, it just shows that, uh, you know, uh, miracles can happen. We head back onto the field when Sports Center returns to enjoy the most uplifting top plays of the night. There's Liza being escorted fittingly by a policeman on her right arm, a fireman on her left arm. And Liza Minnelli, who originally recorded the song 
that has become something of a local anthem. Frank Sinatra, of course, has the more Ladies widely gentlemen. circulated version. For a seventh inning stretch. Uh, a Liza Minnelli treat. with the seventh Tonight, inning stretch about to begin. The city in the world. Set to deliver New York, New York, New York. By one of the greatest entertainers of all time, Liza Minnelli. Miss Minnelli has invited some of tonight's honored guests to join her on the field. Subdued. Yeah, well, we can understand that. And this place is rocking. It started with the ceremony before the game. And what a night here at Shea Stadium. One, two, all.
what a dramatic night it was. Let's take it a shade now for the Mets and the Braves. A game with serious playoff implications. And what an emotional scene this was. There's our mayor who has shown so much great leadership through these very, very tough times. And how great is this? The Mets had some of the rescue workers throw out the first pitch last night. And boy, did they ever get a standing ovation. That right there is what it's all about. Jump to the eighth inning, now game tied at one. Benitez on in relief. Brian Jordan takes him back up the middle. That ball will find the gap out there in left center field. The run scores. And the Braves are now up 2-1 at this point. So we jump to the bottom of the eighth now. Men on first for Mike Piazza. And here it is. Lopez wants it away. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run by Piazza and the Mets lead. What a blast. A two-run shot and the Mets are now up 3-2. Top of the ninth now. And Armando Benitez comes back and he just flat out gets the job done. How about a six? Three double play, and that's your ball game. The Mets win a big one. I mean, a real big one. Three to your final score. So with the win, the Mets are now just four and a half games out of first play. Really, uh, just a, a real, from a personal standpoint, just I'm just so proud to be. Um, uh, I, I truly felt like we were just, you know, spectators tonight. Um, you know, the way they they saluted their.